Okay, great. Um, good evening, good morning, wherever you might be. Um, it's a pleasure to be here once again here tonight with uh, um, Strap. Um, we are uh, co-hosting once again, uh, this case is the third event online we are putting in place uh, for this uh, week, the Science Week in national uh, for Australia, and it's the third event that we've done along with TRAP. Um, I am Coral Martinez Iscar, the director of Instituto Cervantes here in Sydney uh, for Australia, and it is uh, an honor to be here today uh, with a very um, important colleague, uh, our doctor and astrophysicist, it's Angel um, uh, Lopez Sanchez that is here today to bring us uh, a bit closer to the stars, uh, to our solar system, to the nebulae, and to, of course, see Earth uh, from a far distance. Uh, please stay with us for this uh, hour, once again, with a great colleague and a very good re representation of Spanish science uh, scientists here in Australia. I am more than sure that this will be very interesting for all of you. So please uh, stay with us and we will have a very interesting uh, debate as well as the end. Thank you so much, Angel, for being here with us. And thank you so much once again to SRAP uh, for co-hosting this event along with Instituto Cervantes from Sydney. Thank you. Um, ah, here I am. Okay, thank you very much, Coral and Instituto Cervantes for that uh, uh, nice introduction. I you know, with uh, some very warm clothes because I'm in the backyard with my own telescope because this uh, talk is going to be something special. I'm, only not, I'm not going only to, sh to, to give you a trip through the universe, but thanks to technology, I can even show you live some few objects in the sky, and that is the aim for, for tonight. Let me first start... Uh, uh, sharing my my screen and the main presentation I have for you this evening. I will first uh, like to start uh, at least mentioning uh, SRAP, Spanish Researchers in Australia Pacific, Investigadores Españoles in Australia Pacifico. Uh, we are a very young um, association that uh, was founded in 2013 that is a non-profit and we try to disseminate quality science and facilitate collaboration opportunities to contribute to the cultural enrichment and knowledge advance of both Australian and Spanish European societies. And we are a very uh, diverse, uh, uh, vibrant group of people doing many, many, many things. And I'm very lucky to be part of this, uh, the SRAP Association. And we are organizing the event tonight uh, jointly, SRAP and uh, uh, Instituto Cervantes Sydney. Thank you very much for, for all of that. Um, we are right now in SRAP 188 members with half and half females. Actually, we have a bit more females than males, and we have plenty of links with university and other research centers. But tonight, it is a travel to the universe, galaxies and stars, from the Earth to the distant cosmos. I'm Angel Lopez Sanchez, an astrophysicist and a science communicator working at Australian Astronomical Optics at Macquarie University. And as I said, uh, part of the Spanish researchers in Australia Pacific. It's a wrap. And I have plenty of things here, and hopefully, also, we'll get some few uh, questions from you at the end. And I hope that everything works well. Let's go to a start just with, well, what everybody loves, which is the moon. And the moon, that is the image that my son and myself took last night using the same equipment that I'm having here tonight. And believe me that it is just a great world to have a look almost every day, I will say. So it's, it's just a moment when you look through a little telescope. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a big telescope. Just look through a small telescope and you will be able to see all these craters, mountains, the differences between the seas, these uh, very dark patches of, of very large uh, flats. Uh, lands in, in the moon and, and all the details, all the, uh, the features that makes you think about different worlds, not only our planet Earth. Um, but I would like to compare that with the very own image that we are obtaining tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, one moment stop my presentation here. 
I'm going to change to the camera, an extra camera that I have for you tonight. That you will hopefully see me now in the backyard with the telescope. And the telescope is pointing to the moon right now. I just did it before we were starting. And I'm going to share the image that we are getting through the telescope uh, right now of the moon. And you will see that it is a bit different to what we were obtaining, um, we were obtaining last night. So for that, I have my a little iPad here. I can control my telescope with uh, this iPad, which is my son's iPad. And if I do this, and so I can. There it is, the moon as it is right now with my with the telescope. Um, so you, you can see plenty of details here, and that is a completely unprocessed image. I particularly like this, the area of the terminator of the moon, and it is called that way, the terminator. It is uh, the, the moment right now in the moon where the sun is rising. So it's just seeing the sunrise. And it is when you can see the shadows that are very, la very long and casted by all the details, the craters and the mountains. As I said, if you, even with very low magnification, because believe me, right now I'm using the lowest magnification that I can give to the telescope. And uh, it is just a wonder to go through all those uh, different uh, craters and features that we see around the moon. This all this, for example, this great impact crater that you see the rays coming from, from the impact that is a relatively recent crater, impact crater. But let me continue with my uh, with my presentation. Um, where was it? Uh, only everyone watching my things and not what I should be doing. Here it is. So that is the image that we have last night, and I think it is particularly a great project for doing uh, during uh, Science Week or during every time um, for kids. Um, during several years, my son, that right now he is eight, and myself, we have been taking images of the moon, trying to get the different aspects of the, of the lunation, of all the phases of the lunation, all the phases of the moon, as the moon is moving around the Earth. And that is what is causing the different uh, views that we have of the moon, from the crescent moon to full moon or new, uh, new, new moon. And as I said, um, you don't even need a very expensive equipment for trying to do that. Even a DSLR with uh, um, a, um, a bit of a lens, a sun lens, a tele lens, is, is able to provide some uh, images of the, of the moon. On top of that, from time to time, we have these beautiful events uh, that are the total lunar eclipses. eclipses. We had one of these just a couple of months ago on the 26th of May. And, and again, I, I was using the telescope here in the backyard, uh, broadcasting live the, the moon eclipse as it was happening. And that was actually the, the final image that I was able to, to get, combining many images. Actually, this is stacking around uh, 200 different images that uh, I took during the totality. And if uh, you include here some of the partial phases as the moon is moving inside the shadow of the Earth, you can actually see very well the shadow of the Earth. And surprise, surprise, it is not flat, it is round. There you go, another proof that our Earth is completely round. But anyway, don't make me, don't, don't make me start about all of this. Um, a good idea, you want to know a bit more about the, about the moon, perhaps it is going to this beautiful ABC uh, um, pocket guide to the moon that uh, was released a couple of years ago. And my son and myself were providing some of the images for this, uh, for this, uh, for, for this guide. And it is narrated by my very good colleague, uh, Professor Fred Watson. But we can move a bit further away if we think, or if we look at our west, at the west, you probably have seen during these days a very bright object. Actually, many people 
uh, are very confused about this because even they think that it might be an UFO. And the majority of a good part of the UFOs that have been seen actually have been people being confused by Venus. Venus, which is only at 10 light minutes away from the Earth right now. And that is an image that it was taken from the, using the Mariner 10 uh, spacecraft, um, then later reprocessed by Kevin Gill by NASA. Um, and it is a terrestrial planet. It is like uh, our planet, uh, our own Earth, but it has something very different. Although they have Venus and the Earth, uh, very similar masses, Venus have a very dense atmosphere. And that is why we cannot see the surface of Venus. Venus, uh, the atmosphere of Venus is uh, much, uh, several uh, hundred times denser than the one in, on, on the Earth. It has a run out uh, greenhouse effect, plenty of CO2, plenty of uh, uh, sulfur dioxide and, and, and other very dangerous gases. If you are in the surface of Venus, you will be at around 480 degrees and 100 times the pressure in our atmosphere. So that is why it is very difficult to, to get and reach Venus. And it is a, a warning of what something went wrong in this world. But definitely these days, the king of the sky, it is the planet Jupiter. Jupiter, it is a bright, very bright uh, object that is rising over the east at this very moment. And um, uh, amateur astronomers are able to obtain magnificent images of this planet. That is very different to the one that we have um, seen already, very different to the Earth or to Venus or to Mercury or to Mars, because Jupiter, it is a giant gas planet. So everything that you are seeing there, it is the external atmosphere of, of this uh, very big planet. More than a thousand planet Earth will fit inside Jupiter. Particularly during the last uh, few nights and probably during the next uh, few weeks also, because uh, we can get very detailed images of Jupiter. It is what we call in opposition, that is uh, the closest moment to, to the Earth. And it is exactly when it is rising, when the sun is setting. And it's also this time, um, this year, it is uh, very well aligned, the, um, the, the equator of the, of the planet with, with us. And we can see the satellites moving around and projecting the shadows over the planet or sometimes even transiting one over the other. And that is a very nice animation that my friend uh, Andy Castelli took just uh, three days, uh, four days ago, uh, using his uh, telescope in, um, in Melbourne. Jupiter, it is 33 light minutes away. That means that we see Jupiter as it was 33 minutes ago. The other planet that really is uh, outstanding to see using a small telescope, it is Saturn. Even with a small telescope, you can see the rings. Of course, you will not see the details that you are seeing here in this image, because uh, that is an image that was taken uh, by the Cassini spacecraft um, several uh, uh, 10 years ago when the Cassini was uh, still uh, uh, there. Um, um, but you see very clearly all the rings that are made of very tiny particles of ice and rocks and the clouds also. Saturn it is again a giant planet made of gas. It, uh, the Cassini spacecraft provided amazing understanding images of uh, Saturn and I invite everyone if you have not have a chance of seeing them just Google then go to the Cassini webpage and just be, be enjoy enjoy the very beautiful uh, images that um, they were obtaining not only of Saturn and the rings but also of the many moons that are orbiting um, around around uh, um, around Saturn But what else do we have out there? So we have been visiting some few of the objects in our solar system, um, but uh, there are many more stars and objects in, in the night sky. And many times I like to start um, 
talking um, about the stars using this nice image that uh, I took some few years ago from the uh, from Silent Spring Observatory, showing the Southern Cross, which is there here in, in the very center, and the pointers Alpha and Beta Centauri and the Carina constellation. Because precisely this star here, which is Alpha Centauri, which is a double star, that is two stars that uh, we can see very very easily together with the telescope. I was going to move the, the telescope to show you these two, but um, it, uh, I, I, I can show you that later if you prefer. Um, it is at 4.4 light years, meaning that what we are seeing happen 4.4 uh, years uh, ago. And uh, there are two stars very similar to the sun in some way. It is not the closest star to the solar system, because of course the closest star to us it is the sun the closest star to the sun will be proxima centauri which is a red dwarf star located around there you cannot see it in this in this image it is quite faint it was actually discovered uh, in at the beginning of the 20th century but that is the, the closest star to our solar system and it is part of uh, the alpha centauri system so there are actually three stars alpha centauri a and b and proxima centauri orbiting all together very interesting uh, system. But if, if we see this image, other many, many other stars, for example, Gagrux. Gagrux is the red star in the top of the Southern Cross, and that star it is at 89 light years away from us. That means that what we are seeing, the light, uh, happened 89 years ago. And we can go even deeper because Agrox, it is a 322 light years away. Only uh, our original Australians were in this country in, in those times when the light started its trips from Agrox. And if you compare, for example, with Hadar, which is Beta Centauri, the other brightest star of the pointers, that is a 390 light years away. So looking into the sky, looking at the stars, although they seem to be painted uh, in, the, in the sky, they are actually at a very different distances. And that is critical for, for us to understand the distances to stars and galaxies, and one of the most difficult parts in astronomy, believe me, to get the distances. But they are critical because if not, we cannot get uh, the, the, the right uh, um, properties and derive uh, what they are actually uh, the properties of, this, of the systems. The Sun, as I said, it is the closest star to to the Earth, and we actually, it, it's the last reason of life on Earth. It is only at 8.3 light minutes away, meaning what you see in the Sun, it is the light that uh, leaves the surface of the Sun 8.3 minutes ago. And if you compare with the, with the Earth, it's actually this little dot um, there, 1.1 um, million planet Earth will be needed for fitting, fitting the sun. And the sun, again, uh, as it is a star, there is something very important happening in the center of a star, of the center of the sun, which is that the matter is just not solid, it's not liquid, it's not gas, it is another state of matter that we call plasma. That means that the atoms are broken, the nuclei are moving in one way and the electrons are moving in a different way. And there is so much pressure around at 10, 11 million times the pressure of the atmosphere and a huge temperature that is again around 10 to 15, uh, 10, 15 million degrees that it is possible for the nuclei to collide. And when they collide, they are able to uh, stay together and create new elements. Majoritarily, all the stars are made of hydrogen, and what we are seeing in this animation it is a, a fusion and a nuclear reaction of fusions that are creating new elements from hydrogen into helium. I like to say uh, that stars are giant kitchens. You put the hydrogen and you get other elements starting from helium. But let's go to think again about uh, the sun, because the sun, although you have seen that it seems a very large star, well, actually it is not that big, because when we compare with other stars out there, there are many other stars that are much larger than the sun, and not only that, that they have also different colors. You probably have realized that when I was showing you the image before. 
Um, so they, they, they have, for example, very bright giant blue stars at the same time that they are super red giant stars. And that, for example, that little dot there, it is a red dwarf star, for example, Proxima Centauri. At the end of the day, I have many different kinds of stars with colors and so on. And I like to use this, uh, dark, this, this plot of these images with the only diagram I'm going to show tonight for you, that is a very clever diagram in which we are compiling the brightness of the object of the star in the vertical axis, meaning that something in the bottom is not very bright, but something on the top it will be very bright. And these stars, believe me, they are very bright. And in the horizontal axis, we are uh, identifying the color. The blue, it is at the left, the yellow stars are in the middle, the red star at the, at the right part. And that is very, a very important tool that the astrophysicists have been using during the last century to classify stars and to understand galaxy, uh, stellar evolution and also galaxy evolution. Because there is something critical here, that the color, it is actually related to the temperature that the atmosphere of the star has. In the sense that the blue stars are usually the very hot stars and the red stars are very cold and typically also old stars. And that is the moment where I try to say the joke that astrophysicists, we are very confused when we are opening uh, the tap in, 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 because for us, the cold, it is the blue and the hot, it is the red. It is the other way around. And the very first person to realize that was Cecilia Payne. Probably you have never heard of this outstanding a young astroph astrophysicist, and she performed her PhD thesis in the, at Harvard Observatory in 1925. Stellar atmospheres, uh, it was it was called, and it had been the most successful successful PhD thesis ever written. For many of us, it's actually the birth of astrophysics, and we are claiming the importance of uh, having women in science and the importance of uh, uh, really um, stressing the huge work and the great success that many women have had in science. And Cecilia Payne, that perhaps you have never heard of her, it is a wonderful example because she was the very first person in the world to understand that the colors of the stars is consequence of the temperature of the stars and that the stars are giant balls of hydrogen and helium. So now when we are looking into the sky and we are seeing the colors, for example, that is an image that I took some few, few years ago uh, using my digital cameras and um, uh, not, not the telescope itself, it is the, the, the telescope tracking the sky of the Scorpio around here, the Scorpio constellation, the Sagittarius constellation and the center, the part of the Milky Way. When we are seeing all these colors, now we start to understand what is happening because the red stars are usually these old stars that uh, have this cold temperature, but you see many blue stars that are also young, that are young star formation happening in the Milky Way. On top of that, you can go and have a look to the different nebula that you are seeing here. For example, this here, one here, another here, another here, some few that are uh, very, very nice. And, and for that, um, I would like to show you the second time that I'm going to try to, to use my, uh, my telescope and you are, uh, hopefully are going to see it moving. Let's see if everything works. Okay, let me just uh, uh, show me here. And uh, probably you are going to see, uh, see if I can put on this for you. Um, why it is not uh, why it is not working? That it is. I'm going to use my telescope. I'm going to I'm going to show you one of these nebula. And for that, let me one sec. Come here again, and I need to go and say go to M8. I want to go M8. Um,
and you probably will see the telescope that I'm moving to emit that is not far from the moon. It is not far from the moon because actually they are in very, very close together in the constellation of Sagittarius, both of them. Um, and while I'm doing this, I'm going to share the screen better instead of seeing, watching myself. I'm going to show you what I'm doing with the, uh, with the tablet in order that I can show you the live image of this nebula. Let me, let me go and show you this quickly. The first thing I'm going to do, um, probably you're seeing that, it is just changing a filter that is a broad filter. And now let me do this again. Let's go to go to, sorry, no, that one, not that one, eight. So it is amazing, now the technology that we are having right uh, right now. Um, just with a little device that is uh, this little blueberry was that you are seeing here on the weight of the telescope, I'm able to control everything. The mount, two cameras, and an even a filter wheel that the telescope has. The speed filter wheel, it is very important because we need different filters for showing, uh, for, for getting different aspects of the universe. And here it is. You probably don't see much because I need to change this to be auto. And probably what I need to do is also increasing a bit the, the resolution. Let me, let me take quickly, um, in a step of one second, uh, three second exposure. Meanwhile, I also start guiding. This. So you probably have seen that is one of the brightest uh, nebulas in the sky, the Lagoon Nebula. And you probably start to see the gas around the, uh, there and plenty of stars. Those stars, these are that you are seeing here, these, uh, these, they have been born from the nebula. Because that is what nebula uh, do. Nebula are the places where the stars are formed, the majority of these. However, you don't see much. You still see the nebulosity there. You see nebulosity, but not much. That is because the nebula, the gas, is glowing in a very particular light. For that, that is what I said, that I need different filters. I'm going to put a hydrogen filter. That means the nebula are mainly made of, of gas hydrogen, which is the, the, the most abundant element of the universe. And what I'm going to do is just to take a 10 second exposure and you will see the difference between having this filter to see only the hydrogen and not having that filter. Because thanks to that, you will be able to see much better, we will be able to see much better the details of the nebula. And that is what? That is only a 10 second exposure, but something went wrong. And since that this didn't work. So hey, sorry for that. Going to stop there, going to do it again. That is what happens when you are doing things quickly. But I think I, uh, it's clear and evident, though it's very blurry at the moment, send me one, one sec to take uh, the image again, that now you see definitely well the gas and the dust in the nebula. It's a bit better. It's still not, not uh, it is not very big. It, it's still not very deep because of course, we are only taking a 10 second exposure. We are not taking a minute or several minutes exposure, but still you are seeing life right now the image that we are obtaining with this telescope of the uh, of the um, um, Lagoon Nebula. Let me go back again to my presentation. There we go. Because that will be the image that we will get if we stack uh, several dozens of images together in different filters that will, and you get the different colors, that will be something that you will obtain, the, the image. And that is the way all astronomical images are always taken. We don't see in color. We usually use filters and black and white uh, detectors or grayscale detectors. The Lagoon Nebula, it is uh, 4,300 light years away. And as I said, plenty of, many of these stars have been born inside the nebula. 
There are many other nebulas around there. Another one that is one of my favorites, it is the Triffid Nebula at 5,000 light years away. It is called the Triffid for this structure in the, in the dust. And um, it is not only an emission nebula like this one, but also a reflection nebula. And you see the blue colors here because the, there is the, this star in very, very uh, bright, very bright, uh, uh, very blue, very hot, very young, and that the dust and the gas is reflecting the light from that star. As I said, that is basically what we want to, to see. Uh, if we want to observe the universe in detail, we need these different filters in order that we can understand much better what they are made of. For example, the Eagle Nebula in 16, and that is an image that I took when I was finishing my PhD in the Canary Islands at the Isaac Newton Telescope. And that is another of the nebulas that we could observe right now. It is almost in the zenith. Um, and again, in red, it is the hydrogen, and in blue, you are seeing the stars. But if we use other kind of filters, we get more colors, more information. In this image, what you are seeing in blue, it is the glowing oxygen. And what you are seeing in green, again, it is the hydrogen. But in, in red, it is the sulfur of the nebula. So we are detecting the different chemical elements that are out there in the space. And why is that important? As I said before, the stars are giant kitchens. When you have the star, you have a big layer of hydrogen. Almost everything is hydrogen. And hydrogen is burned into helium in the, in the stellar interiors, in the cores. There is a moment in the life of the stars, well, the majority of the time, for many, 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 many billions of years, the sun will be doing burning hydrogen into helium for almost uh, 8 billion years. But there is a moment in which it's not able to burn more helium, more, more hydrogen. So the helium can be burned to, build, to, to create new elements, carbon and oxygen, that they are later burned to get new magnesium, sodium, later another layer of silicon, sulfur, and, and argon, calcium, titanium, and at the end having a core of iron nickel. And when that happens, it is when a massive star explodes as a type 2 supernova. And I want to make this clear, that process of getting all those different uh, uh, nuclear reactions until reaching the iron core, it's only possible for stars that are most massive that eight or nine times the mass of the sun. But these are very important, these massive stars, because they are exploding as a supernova. And sun, and the, the, the material condenses in, in a neutron star of a black hole, and one of these cosmic explosions happened in the year 1054 of our era, that it was recorded by Chinese and American uh, astronomers, but not seen in Europe, uh, I guess why? Because it was a very bright object that you could see even during the daylight. And it is the Croft Nebula. The Croft Nebula that is located at 6,200 uh, light years away from us, it is the remnants of one of these titanic uh, supernova explosions. However, low mass stars, as the sun, they are going to die in a very different way. What is happening it is that the, as they don't have enough mass, they don't have too much gravity, and the gas, it is, is from the external atmosphere, it is expanding, it is just going away into the interstellar medium. And eventually, it will form a kind of a, a big cocoon that is called a planetary nebula. A magnificent example of this planetary nebula that the name doesn't have to do anything with planets, it's just the, the name that they gave it in the 17th, 18th century when this subject was starting to be discovered with a small telescope. And this object it is a 690, uh, sorry, a 790 light years away. And again, that is an image that I, I got with this uh, telescope that I have been showing you uh, tonight. It, and all plenty of the gas that is and, and returning that material that was cooked into the star, into the interstellar medium. And that is a key point that I wanted to make today, to tonight. That is the cosmic origin, origin of the elements. Everything that is in our body has been cooked in the stars or because of the evolution of the stars. If not, hydrogen or the helium that, that were the only elements that were created in the Big Bang. We are really the ashes of the stars that lived billions of years ago.
Okay, so coming back to our night sky, I would like to show you some few more objects before moving into the galaxies. Particularly here, we are, and there is another very bright nebula, the Carina Nebula, 7,500 uh, light years away. But I don't want to forget to mention that patch, dark patch here, which is the Coalsack Nebula, 590 light years away. That is actually a nebula. But there is nothing inside the nebula that is able to provide, that is glowing. So we see just basically as a dust, the dust and the, the gas that is able to stop the background light, the, the, the other objects that are in the background. And that is uh, very uh, cleverly seen in by uh, the Aboriginal culture here in Australia because they, uh, the, 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 the sky from the southern the, from the, from the southern hemisphere of the earth it is just magnificent. It is something that everyone has to see in a very dark place. Um, Aboriginal Australians they were able to see constellations that are dark constellations. The sky is so bright with so many stars, and that is an example from Sidon Spring Observatory, that they recognized that the gold sack was the head of a giant emu that was just that the body here and the, le and the legs in the part of the center of the Milky Way in the constellation of Scorpio and Sagittarius. So we have to recognize the, the, the deep connection the Aboriginal Australians had with uh, the night sky. There's some few more objects I wanted to show you here. The jewel box, for example, it is a very nice star, uh, star, uh, star cluster with uh, some few hundreds of stars. But particularly, I want to show you this, this one here. That is not a star, although it has the name of a star, Omega Centauri. It is located at 17,000 light years away, and it is actually a globular cluster. There are 10 million of stars condense and um, all put together in this uh, very nice object. And, and this is very probably the remnant of a dwarf galaxy that was uh, eaten in the past by our own Milky Way galaxy. So when we are seeing the sky with all, uh, in an own sky image, as I said before, it is just magnificent to see the Milky Way with the center of the Milky Way in close to the zenith of the image of the, of the sky. And we see it here in this image. And that is something that we can only get from the Southern Hemisphere and all the beautiful objects that are there. And I want to show you right now these two that are not very well visible this time of the year at the beginning of the night. You can see that later. But these are the two Magallanic clouds. The large Magallanic clouds that is located 158,000 light years away and the small Magallanic cloud at uh, almost 200,000 light years away. These are galaxies. These are dwarf galaxies that are satellites of our own Milky Way. And we know plenty of things about these uh, in very interesting objects because they are forming many stars. There is a very bright uh, nebula here, 30 Doradus, 30 Doradus, or the Tarantula Nebula. The same thing about uh, the, um, the small Magellanic clouds. They are actually connected in a diffuse gas, gas, gas tail that is also around our own Milky Way. And it is just a, a very interesting way of see the action, how galaxies are evolving and merging through time. And we are starting to, we, we see that in our, uni, in our very, very own Milky Way galaxy. So if we could put all the sky in a single image in the same way that we put uh, on the, the map of the earth with all the continents and the oceans and the countries and the seas, that would be something that we will get with the equator, meaning the, the equator of the, the own Milky Way galaxy, the center of the Milky Way, Milky Way in, they are in the center. And that is what we see because we are inside the Milky Way galaxy. We cannot see it from outside. So we have to rely on very sophisticated methods to try to understand exactly the shape and, uh, and how and the shape of the Milky Way and how our galaxy is. But we are right now quite confident that our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy like this one with a prominent bulge, a, a bar from there, two very clear uh, spiral arms are uh, starting. And we are not located it's 
just and a half uh, thousand light years away from the center of the of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, but we know that because we have been uh, observing very different other galaxies and also using many different techniques to have a very good idea how our Milky Way is. If we could see a galaxy like uh, in a step of phase on H on would be something like that, a spiral galaxy, uh, the Sombrero galaxy and 104 or 28 million light years away. Um, so that will be kind of a comparison. But at the end of the day, even though there are trillions of galaxies out there, we can classify galaxies mainly in, into two, <laughs> basically into two categories or three the two categories and the, the regular. We have a spiral galaxies like the Milky Way and elliptical galaxies like uh, this one, this object is a 325 minus G004, very romantic. Um, they are two very different kind of objects. A spiral galaxies like the Milky Way, you see the blue stars, the star formation happening. These pink regions are the nebula, the star forming regions of the galaxy. Still the center have all the stars and that is what you see the reddish color, but the spiral galaxies, it is where everything is happening, when you have all this activity and star formation, like in the Milky Way. However, well, the elliptical galaxies, well, they don't have the star formation, they don't have gas and or dust, they, have, they are mainly made of very old stars. Um, yeah, well, I prefer the, the, the spiral galaxies, the, the elliptical galaxies, of, and that is why I do research on the spiral galaxies. But I really want to emphasize also that the elliptical galaxies are really, really interesting too because of different factors. I don't want to forget to say that we also need to look in different colors, not the different colors that the colors that we see, but the different colors that we don't see. In the, in, when we are com considering all the full uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And I like to use this image from my own research, M83, um, that is another spiral galaxy like the Milky Way, only located 16 million light years away. Uh, again, it is right now visible in the sky, a good point, point the telescope to this object. But when uh, we observe that with different colors, for example, with ultraviolet, we see many, many uh, star forming radios in the outer skirts of the galaxy. That this was detected only 15 years ago. We're using uh, ultraviolet uh, image, images with, uh, sat with a satellite that it was called GALAX. But the reason I moved to Australia 14 years ago was to try to understand the, this kind of galaxies and the diffuse gas that the galaxies have that we can only observe using radio telescopes because that glowing gas, the neutral gas of hydrogen, we need only uh, this kind of uh, radio waves for detecting them. And that was the, the data that we were able to obtain using the Australian telescope compact array in which the gas of the star that is this pale blue that you see all around, it is just uh, huge. And you see uh, structures like tidal tails and streamers and condensation of gas. And I want to emphasize that the size of this in the sky, if we could see this neutral, neutral hydrogen gas in, ra in radio, if we could see with our eyes, that will, that will be almost two full moons in the sky in this galaxy alone. So that is why we need all the different uh, uh, galaxies, so the other the different for the different puzzle for understanding the puzzle of the galaxy evolution. And we are going to move away from from the the nearby the Nerva universe. Let me show you at least the Virgo cluster of galaxies. That was a fantastic image that a very famous astrophotographer Helio Bernal Andreo obtained some few years ago. Uh, the Virgo cluster of galaxies. You see plenty of some hundreds, uh, probably even thousands of of galaxies. Is, it's located at 48 million light years away, that is M87, the center, uh, the core, the most uh, massive galaxy in the Virgo cluster of galaxies, because that is the way the universe uh, works. We have galaxies that are um, together in groups of galaxies, and groups of galaxies are making cluster of galaxies. And 
precisely that was uh, understanding the distribution of galaxies in the universe uh, was one of the very uh, successes from the Anglo-Australian telescope. Um, this, uh, the very first survey that it was completed in 2002, the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey, was able to get and obtain data from 200 and 300, uh, 230,000 galaxies to a depth of two and a half billion light years. As you are moving away, the center here will be the Milky Way. As you are moving away from here, you are going um, to a more and more distant uh, in the universe to get into two and a half billion light years in the edges. And every color that you are seeing, every point that you're seeing there, it is just a galaxy. A galaxy, and the color is just given by the density of galaxies. So we see that the large scale structure of the universe, it is uh, not random. And it is a kind of this filamentary structure where we have the supercluster super of galaxies, filaments, big voids, and so on. On top of that, we have been able to obtain even uh, deeper observations of galaxies and, and to a depth of 5 billion light years. And that was part of the Galaxy Mass Assembly uh, at the Anglo Australian Telescope, that, that big project in which I have been part of, uh, that we observed 300, uh, 320,000 galaxies uh, to that depth. And what you're seeing here, it is an animation of, of one of the five. Uh, different uh, position of the sky that we were able to see. And this is real data. Real data, the distances have been obtained with our observations. The images are not from now, from the AAT, or from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, from another survey from the US. Um, although I want to emphasize and that um, we have to be careful with this animation because the sizes of the galaxies have been enormously exaggerated. If it wasn't because they are very much larger than what they are, we will not see anything because the distances between galaxies are millions, tens of millions of uh, light years, while the size of a galaxy is only around 100,000 light years, so we will not see much. Perhaps one of the famous images of the Hubble Space Telescope was this ultra deep field that it was observing a black park part of the sky during 10 days consecutively and at the end the people were expecting to see some few galaxies but actually they found many many galaxies reaching a depth of 13 billion light years away some of these tiny little blobs almost everything that you are seeing in this image it is a galaxy and that is only a part of the Hubble deep field, ultra deep field image However, right now, the most distant galaxy that we know to date, it is GNZ11, that is a 13.6 billion light years away. Um, and it is this, this little blob that it was also observed with a uh, radio interferometer, um, just an uh, object that is forming plenty, plenty of stars. So what is the most distant thing that we can see in the universe? Well, it is actually the cosmic background radiation. And that is the echo of the Big Bang, when the universe was still very hot, but it was the moment that uh, the process that we call the recombination happened. It was the moment that the electrons were able to uh, be uh, bind to atoms, and to, to the nuclei and form atoms, and the light was released. That happened around 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and that is the deepest image that we can ever Get, and that is an image from the WMAP uh, science team. And you see that it is not homogeneous. They have different uh, colors that are indicating that the seed of the different uh, supercluster of galaxies that are going to be formed with, with evolution of the time. Perhaps you, when, you, when I say that this is located at 46 billion light years away, you are thinking, wait a moment. But the universe is 13.8 billion years old. How can we see something that is at 46 billion light years away? Well, that is a very easy explanation. It is because the expansion of the universe is accelerating. From the beginning of the time, at the beginning, the acceleration was slower. That it is what is happening right now. The accelerating universe, it is what is pushing and we are able to see much more in the distance that we, we, we perhaps logically can think about. That was a very uh, big 
and discovery in the very late of the 20th century. And it was at the end a Nobel Prize for uh, Brian Smith and uh, the ENI and many, uh, some few other astrophysicists because it's really changed our understanding of the universe so much that right now, when we are saying what is the recipe of our universe, we say that what we are made of, the majority of the things I have been talking about, almost everything that I have been talking about during my presentation, the atoms that made up the stars, the nebula, the galaxies, almost everything that we see, uh, it is not even the 5% of what it is in the universe. There is a part that is 27% that is dark matter, and there is another part that we don't understand at all that we call the dark energy, that is the, the, the thing that is pushing the expansion of the universe, that is around 68% of the universe. So with this in mind, and having uh, a view of the cosmic perspective that I have been, I have been guiding you from, from the moon from to the distant universe, let's go to think about for a moment where we are. That is one of the most important images I think that have ever been taken. You don't see perhaps it is not much, it is a little dot. Well, that is us, that is the Earth. That is an image that was taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft on the Valentine's Day 1990 at a distance of 6 billion kilometers. And that is the only thing that we could see from that distance. Because when we compare with the huge distances in the universe, well, the solar system, or the sun, the earth, even Pluto, it is that we are actually in the same, very same place. But it makes us think about our little blue marble, our little blue pale dot. That is another of these very iconic images that was taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts on the 7th December of 1972 at a distance of only 0.15 light seconds from the surface of the Earth. And we are all there. And there is a little reflection that my son, a couple of years ago, made for an assignment about taking care of our environment. Not other planet in the solar system, not even Mars, and none of the more than 4,000 planets that astronomers have discovered that are other stars are like the Earth. We have to take care of our home world. It is the only Earth we will ever know. And really, we have to take care of our home planet. And with that, I will finish. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. And I will be very happy to take some questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Angel. Thank you. So, um, yes, thanks everyone to join in this, uh, this talk with Dr. Angel. So if you've got any questions, that's, that's the moment. So you can use the Q&A button. Uh, we already have at least three queries. So we are going to start for um, Kate. So Kate is asking, how do the colors of Venus occur? Are the colors of all the planets due to the atmosphere density and elements in the atmosphere? Uh, yes, that is a very clever question. Definitely the colors are going to depend in of the, of the composition what that you have in there. Um, it is not only the composition, it is also what is happening there. Because remember when I show you images of Jupiter and Saturn, and in Jupiter you see very well the bands, different colors, the red, the yellows. And in Saturn, that is made exactly of the same composition, the, uh, the colors are not that clear. And that is because the light of the sun is able to produce an, uh, reactions, uh, chemical reaction in the, cloud, in the, the clouds of Jupiter. And that is what is making the colors, but the, uh, the energy of the sun is not that strong in Saturn, that is much farther away than Jupiter. So it is a combination of several factors, but def definitely, for example, when we are seeing Mars, everyone is very happy or whatever with Mars. Mars, I have been, uh, I haven't, I have never been a very fan of Mars because it is a very disappointing planet to see with a telescope. It's tiny, you only see details and it is red because you are seeing the surface, the surface that is made of a uh, com complex of uh, oxygen and, and plenty of iron too. Ox uh, so, so you see that. Um, in the moon, the moon also have colors, but it's difficult to get them. 
uh, there is a way of getting images of the moon even with small telescopes and you get the uh, stack many many of them and you get a saturation of the colors and you will see that some areas are starting to be uh, blue because they are rich in titanium and some few of cobalt i don't remember exactly the, the, what 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 but it is another areas are more reddish or green or greenish and that is because of that, because of the different composition that the uh, that, that, that that the moon has, so yeah, depends of of that. Mm, very interesting. So, soy soy from soy Onel, he's asking if will we ever live life on another planet. So 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 say say it again. Yes. Uh, so, are we going to live in the future in another planet? <laughs> well, that is. Uh, Difficult question to answer, I will say. Yeah. Um, prob probably we'll be able to live in colonies eventually in other planets in the moon, in Mars. There are plenty of effort to try to travel to Mars, although it's difficult because of a combination of very uh, different reasons and I'm not going to explain you in detail out here. But uh, um, I, I'm confident that we, if we work together, eventually we will be able to live in, in other parts of the solar system, in other parts in the moon, in Mars, in asteroids. There are plenty of interest in asteroids. Um, you can have one. There is a very nice uh, science fiction uh, TV series, which is called The Expanse. That is the main topic. It is about that, that uh, the Earth, uh, the, the humans, have, we have been able to, uh, to colonize several other plan planets and asteroids and satellites around Jupiter and Saturn. Who knows? It's still challenging, it's still difficult, but perhaps. Perhaps, yeah. So another question from Luis. So Luis has been very engaging today in the chat. He's got very interesting views. So he's asking, are the big uh, voids really empty or are just a smaller density of stars? Thanks. Well, in the voids that we see in the largest scale structure of the universe, they are not completely empty. We call them voids because apparently they don't have much, but they do have small galaxies and they do have some gas and they do have objects in there. Um, but the densities are really small when we compare, for example, what we found in, uh, what we find in supercluster of galaxies that uh, you have ten on thousands of galaxies in just a very tiny place with several of what we call the filaments merging together forming this kind of big structure but that is key it is a very clever question because for understanding that for understanding the large scale structure of the universe that we can reproduce with models we need to include what we call the cold dark matter on that um, it is one, another extra proof of the existence of the dark matter I have not talked about dark matter in my presentation, just mentioning it. Uh, many people say, well, because dark matter, uh, it is what may, it is making that the galaxies, uh, the part of the external part of the galaxies are going faster than what they should be because of plenty of mass there. But that is only one of the 13 or 14 different astronomical proofs that we have that there is something that we don't know what it is, but it is not interacting with uh, with uh, gravity, with with electricity, with el um, electromagnetic uh, force only by gravity, and that is very interesting for physicists and not only astrophysicists, because it is just moving forward what we call the standard model of particles in uh, in physics. Okay, so another question. So we've got a few more minutes. If uh, we can, we will try, Angel, to reply all the queries. So we have now one, two, three, four more questions. And also, Carmen, I see you, you are also uh, making questions through the chat. So you reckon, uh, Angel, that you will be able to reply everyone? Yeah, I can try. Yeah. Okay. I direct uh, way of finding the plot but uh, there is I see a conversation about clarifying what fission energy yes. and fusion energy mm -hmm. is uh, fusion energy it is what I have been explaining what is happening inside the stars it is what you have different atoms that you fusion them merge them together and form new elements you can do this till iron iron the iron it is the most stable uh, nuclei in the universe 
you cannot fusion it or you cannot break it. And that is one of the reasons why the stars, a massive star explodes a supernova. I'm not going into that detail there. But on the other end, you have very heavy elements that you can break them. And breaking them, you are releasing energy. And that is the fission. The fission meaning the break, breaking the nuclei. And it is a great topic to talk about because it is very much misunderstood everywhere. And, and perhaps if you are following me on Twitter and recently and also with the... Uh, with the what with what my uh, the last life emphasizing that we have to take in care of our planet Earth and right now the, one of the main problems that we have uh, worldwide is, is the problem of, of climate change that is affecting everybody and every everyone in, in, we want to recognize it or not but uh, the IPCC report came last week and it is uh, understanding evidence that it is us what we are creating that and we have to stop releasing future fuels. Uh, burning fossil fuels for, for doing that. And one way of reducing fusion fuel right now, it is going into fission, nuclear fission reaction. That is what has been happening during many, many, many years. And many countries are doing that, for example, in France. In France, I have been able to reduce that. So what I'm doing a bit of advocacy, and perhaps that will be for another talk, about the importance of really considering these kind of different sources of energy that are actually, it is actually much better than people think and not that we don't have any problems right now we know how to treat it we know how to do it it is just uh, in, i'm not going to go into it that will be for another uh, conversation uh, ask me another thing <laughs> <laughs> yes we need to to organize another conference so uh, what happens if a black hole actually collides into another black hole what happens well, well, we have gravitational waves <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, we, that have been always uh, the the idea that black holes were able to collide together and form larger black holes, and in that way, as they have this very energetic phenomena, um, they will be able to, in some way, distort distort the space time continuum, and that is what we are detecting with the gravitational waves. I have not talked about gravitational waves. So I was close to mention or say something about that research at the moment. Um, when two black holes uh, merge together, they release this in the um, um, uh, gravitational waves and they are making larger black holes. And that is also very interesting because in all the centers of all the galaxies, we are observing supermassive black holes. When we are talking about supermassive black holes, these are black holes that have masses of a million, a hundred thousand, a hundred millions, a thousand million times the mass of the sun, so very big, huge black holes. And from how are these black holes produced? That is a big question in astronomy. What big, some people think that at the beginning we only have a small black holes from the death of the very massive stars, and we know that at the beginning of the universe, the majority of the stars were very massive and they died very quickly in supernova explosion. We know that because. One of the key ingredients for understanding galaxy evolution is the chemical composition. And when you only have hydrogen and helium, you reach all of, you reach very big, massive stars. And from there, our mass, uh, black holes are starting to merge and merge, merge, merging, and in some way forming these very big black holes. It is not the only hypothesis. There are some few other ideas, including primordial black holes, for explaining this. So it is. Uh, Interesting topic right now, plenty of people doing deep research and also what is able to give us the hearing because it is not electromagnetic light. So I was mentioning the colors of the universe, blue, red, whatever, and the ultraviolet, uh, the infrared, the X-rays or the gamma rays, these are all colors, electromagnetic radiation. But um, uh, gravitational waves, they're different. It is something different. So. Remember when I told you that the, the, the farthest thing that we can see it is the cosmic background, cosmic background radiation. That is not the case for hearing gravitational waves. So one of the next challenges is actually listen to the gravitational waves that were created at the beginning of the time in the Big Bang, much at the almost zero, well, not almost zero, but yeah, the very beginning of the universe definitely much, much, much closer to the beginning of the universe at the 380,000 uh, years that we are seeing of the cosmic background radiation. 
Amazing, Angel. So um, I, I'm thinking that maybe we can make a um, last question and then if the rest of the people agrees, if they have more queries, they can send us an email. Also, it will be great to have some feedback. Uh, hopefully you, you guys enjoyed this, this talk. And before our director, Coral, also uh, close this session. Angel, do you agree? Just to reply this last yes. question. Yes, Defin perfect. definitely. Yes, happy to do that. <laughs> Thanks, Angel. So uh, we've got uh, John Bradley here, here. So John, basically he's curious about uh, if you can give us some basic details about the telescope that you have been using this evening. I'm curious too. How can you get this telescope? The telescope? Yeah. Hopefully it will be working. Uh, it should be now. Yes. So that is a refractor telescope. It is a relatively small telescope. Uh, it, telescope. it is only 80, cent 80, 80 millimeters, the main lens. And right now the camera, which is the red thing that you probably see here, that thing there, uh, it is just connected as an IP. So it is just what we call a primary focus. Um, it is called a Black Diamond uh, Telescope, the Skywatcher Black Diamond 80, um, and uh, relatively well, intermediate focal ratio. Uh, I also have a, what we call a focal reducer there. Um, the telescope itself, only the optical tube is not expensive. It is actually a relatively cheap one. Probably you can get by $800 or $900 at least because it is a good quality. It is a good quality, but uh, there are some few telescopes of the same size, refractor telescopes, that uh, they are two, three thousand dollars Astronomy is an expensive hobby, go to say that. But as I said, it is a refractor telescope. That means that it's made of lenses. It is not a reflector that is using mirrors to reflect the light or a cathodioptrix that is when using the lenses and the mirrors for getting the light. Okay, fantastic. So it will be amazing. Thanks, thanks Angel for the talk. So can Coral get in to, to close this session? Can you please Angel, actually, yeah, I think that we can make Coral, yes, here's Coral. So I will leave you guys for the final words. Thank you. Nothing. This, the, the important part has been done. Angel, this was wonderful. You took us to the moon and back. <laughs> you brought us to another, another world and, and it, it was amazing. And, and I saw in the, the chat was quite um, alive with a lot of questions and I will try to go back with the answers of these questions. I also have a few uh, queries, but I loved someone that said that your enthusiasm is contagious. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much because you just made it so much easier for people that are not experts such as myself and others a lot of people that are very interested in this topic it's really amazing what you do uh the information that you that you give us uh and and everything that's out there that we just um uh, we're just uh, a, a telescope away from from knowing it thank you so much for your time it's an honor to have you here with us uh today and always uh thank you so much for to you and to israp and to all of the people that are on the other side, uh, we'll keep on uh, doing um, events on science because this was uh, incredibly amazing. It personally, for me, this was uh, very, very interesting. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me and for organizing this. And thank you everyone for all the support and nice words. So you know when, where you can find me. Gracias a todos. Gracias a todos. Un saludo.